OPAC Hedgesville High graduate David Abella. David, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, and let's add Shepherd University graduate. That's right. Were you there when it was Shepherd College or was it Shepherd University? It was still the college at that time, but uh, Notre Dame on the Potomac River, I like to call it. Yeah, and uh, you are an attendee along with uh, me in the famous Gus Farratt headbutt uh, game against the New York Giants where he headbutted the stadium and knocked himself out of the game. <laughs> Right. You remember uh, that? You know, that, that's, what this, uh, that's what this presidential election feels like a little bit. It did. did. <laughs> knocked, knocked out of the game there. Yeah. A couple other things, David. He was Board of Governors with Shepard, may still be. Also, he was the intellectual founder of the Stubblefield Institute, mm -hmm. which we give him a lot of credit for. It's a good Thank resume. You. Good resume. Uh, David, your thoughts as the president of GOPAC on the setup now with this election? The dynamic has just changed with Biden out and maybe Harris in to take on the Republican nominee, Donald Trump. Let's start with uh, President Biden may be sitting at the resolute desk in the Oval Office, but this is, is now the Kamala Harris administration, that there is no way uh, a decision, policy decision is going to get made that she has not had at least input on, if not outright sign off on, because now she is the one controlling the message for Democrats for the 2020 for election and any policy position uh, has to be one she's in agreement with. Uh, all that to say, and this really gets to number two, uh, the reason why Biden-Harris is at 36 percent, it's more than just the concern about uh, President Biden's ability to do his job. It was the policies he pursued that got us to where we are, uh, whether that be that is harder, it's more expensive, uh, the border is in chaos, um, we're now buying energy from people who don't like us, which we weren't doing a few years ago uh, in the Trump administration, whether it's openly saying they're going to get rid of the bipartisan tax cuts that passed during the Trump administration. I mean, go down issue after issue. And it's not hard to see why President Biden and the vice president are sitting at 36 percent approval rating. Americans can tell you why they don't. Now, all of that to say, that now presents the vice president the challenge that every that, that she has to show she's up for this job. And her first speech and her first interview, what she's going to have to do, are going to be very telling for her. You get to make one first impression. And every time this administration has put her in the spotlight to shine. She has not lived up to expectations, and they've taken her back out of the spotlight. That's why this first interview and this first uh, speech that she gives are going to be so important. We're either going to have a really competitive general election or we're going to have a blowout uh, on the side of the Republicans. Uh, David's schedule dictates he has to go at 945, so we are tight on time. Bill, your question. Yeah, uh, uh David, I'm, I'm a little surprised about uh, the fact you say that she has been a, uh, ineffective as, uh, in appearing before the public. Uh, I thought through time she'd become more effective. Am I just saying it uh, different than what you are? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, maybe we have a different view on it, Bill, but let me just say if you ask the majority of Americans, has she done a uh, is the border in chaos or not in chaos? They're going to say it's in chaos. This administration put her in charge of, of border security. Um, she go down uh, on key issues that this administration has put her on in charge of. And in every one of those, Americans don't like the position of the Biden administration. And thus, that presents two idea problems. One, it's either the idea is bad or they can't communicate it very well. Thus, she hasn't done a very good job, I would offer to you, uh, in being able to make the case for democratic policy. Let's also keep in mind, we don't, we don't think back to now her 2020 campaign. And not that she didn't, you know, she rose very quickly and fell very quickly. Um, so even Democratic voters were not particularly excited about her in 2020. But this is a, a at that time, candidate who was one of the first to sign on to Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all. I mean, arguably the biggest winner, second winner next to the vice president in all this is Bernie Sanders, because now he truly does have an intellectual partner 
in where they see that where this country should go that ten, that is outside the mainstream of where most Americans think. I mean, Biden got the nomination because he was seen as one who would not push radical progressive policies. And he's now being replaced with a vice president that is completely in line with, with Bernie Sanders. And uh, he Bernie has to be feeling pretty good today. John Gilstrap, uh, Sam Pensock was just on the show, and he made it pretty clear that this campaign is going to be packaged as a young former prosecutor against an old convicted felon. What's the Republicans' answer to that going to be? Do we still have you, David? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, let's go down and look at her position on uh, keeping people safe as a prosecutor. This is a, a, a vice president who has made some pretty anti-police remarks, um, things to, that policing should be moved past just police officers. And while there is a case for, for certain policies, she's going to have to outline, outline where those are. Um, she is one of those uh, prosecuting attorneys that fell in the mold of those who said, we're only going to enforce certain laws. They come out with a, it's called, it's a day one memo that a group of prosecuting attorneys around the country sign and submit and say, these are the laws we're not going to enforce. We can't have a president who picks and chooses which laws they're going to enforce. They have to, enforce the laws that Congress passes. And she's going to have to make make the case for that, that her background as a prosecuting attorney, picking and choosing which laws she was going to enforce, that that makes our country safer, that it makes our community safer. And that if, is that her governing philosophy overall? So then what other is, laws is she not going to enforce? Now, again, this Sam mentioned you know, young versus old and Trump is 78. Kamala Harris is going to be 60 in October. So this isn't some 40-year-old. I'm 61. No one's calling me young. <laughs> so Bill maybe sometimes but, calls but, me young. But relative to some of the others, you well, are young. Relative yeah. to yeah. a 78 or an 81-year-old yeah. president, yeah. you're young. Yeah. But th again, this isn't John F. Kennedy, you know, what was he, 43 or, or whatever uh, years of age at the time. Uh, David, uh, final minute here. Uh, why hasn't the head of the Secret Service resigned yet? Uh, great question. Uh, no one in this administration gets fired for their incompetence, and rarely do they resign. It makes absolutely no sense. It, she shouldn't have to resign. She should have been fired a week ago. But that doesn't happen in this administration, and it's, it's uh, I suppose if you're an employee of the Biden administration, it's a good thing. It is not a good thing for the country. I'm baffled by it myself. I don't understand it. Kimberly Cheadle, as you said, I didn't expect her to get fired, but I certainly expected that she would fall on the sword and resign on this one because when a department fails as badly as they failed last week, the head of that department resigns. That's how it works. And she's going to keep her job, and that's ridiculous. Uh, David, 30 seconds left. Final thought is yours. It's going to be an exciting uh, four months. Many twists and turns left. Look forward to joining again to talk about it. Thank you, David. Have a great day, sir. Thank you. Bye, Bill. Thank you, David.